Good morning, everybody, and welcome. This is the Saturday morning Viper Trading Webinar. If you are here to learn about trading the futures markets using the Viper tools, you are absolutely in the right place. Today's topic is trade two lot, one um, scalper, one runner. But, of course, uh, there's much more to trading than just that. So, obviously, we're going to um, cover a lot more uh, detail. This is actually part two of a two-part series. The first part was on Thursday night. Hopefully, everybody had a chance to wa uh, watch that one because I covered a lot of the basics. Um, I'll, I'll just quickly touch on some of the basics, but not spending more than just a couple of minutes on it because I'm assuming that most of you either attended that or have al uh, already watched part one from Thursday night. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with the um, disclaimer. All communications from Viper Trading Systems are for educational purposes only. Futures trading does involve risk, and there is a risk of loss. Nothing contained in this webinar or other webinars, including the live trading room, are to be construed as investment or trading advice. And, of course, everybody in here does know that you do trade at your own sole discretion. All right, with that out of the way, let's get over to a couple of charts that I want to talk about this morning. Uh, over on screen one. Welcome, Kevin. Kevin says, I just uh, I just finished signing up. Welcome to the team, Kevin. Good for you. Well, I hope everybody's going to see some things here that are going to get you excited and fired up about uh, uh, trading on Monday morning and next week and start making some good coin. So what I want to show here is I'm going to show some trades. Let me back up. Because this is the end of the open house um, uh, week, and so some of you still might be looking at, at some of this for the first time. So let me just, uh, uh, before we get into the trade setups themselves and correlations that we're looking at, I'm going to um, explain what you're looking at. Um, we're connected to a data feed uh, to our broker, NinjaTrader. And um, we trade, uh, uh, in this case here on the on ES, I use two range bars because they um, give you more detail around trade entries because ES can be a little bit slower than the other markets and you really need that good granularity, that good detail to take the trades. Most of the time we're trading four range bars over here on YM. You can see that. Um, if you just had a data coming in um, unfiltered or not uh, going through any indicators, it's, this would just be basically bars just kind of going up and down and very difficult to trade. So what our indicators do is they give you, uh, the trader, some form and structure to see trades and to know how and where to get in. So namely what you're seeing here is uh, background colors, green, uh, red, and this uh, indeterminate color here that is usually uh, means lack of trend or you're in between trends. A bar colors, obviously, blue, yellow, and red. You can see that. Uh, we have the predictors. They okay, paint in real time. We have those on in the in live room. I'm going to just t toggle them off for the purpose of this webinar right now. Uh, you can't see the power meters. I don't know why this isn't lighting up. Uh, this is normally red and green. Uh, it's different trends on the chart. It's called power meters. We have uh, the... Uh, we have the uh, Object trader alerts, uptrend, you toggle on the long alerts, downtrend, you toggle on the shorts. And the most uh, prominent thing, of course, on here is the bands. So we have a thick line here called the mid band, which features prominently in our trading. And then you have um, one, two, three, four bands below it. The thin red line above uh, uh, band two is called line two. And we have one, two, three, four bands above it for a total of eight. And the thin green line above a band six is called line six right here. And that features into our trading too. So now you have some, now we just don't have a bunch of bars kind of flying around on a chart. We trade markets intraday. So if you don't want to trigger the overnight margin uh, with your broker on holding overnight positions, we don't recommend that, it, mainly because um, – the uh, unrest in the Middle East, of course, um, there's problems all over the world for various reasons. And so what happens is, let's say, for instance, you go over here on some day and you feel the market is heading down and you establish a short position and it goes into an overnight condition where the market starts to run up like this in the Asian and European sessions. Well, you would get creamed. So it's for that reason 
that we do not hold overnight positions. We don't do that. What we do is we try to um, finish our trading by the close of the uh, U.S. trading session, which is you really want to be up by 1 o'clock Pacific, 4 o'clock Eastern. You want to be flat. In fact, truth be told, I would say that probably 75, 80, fully 90 plus percent of the trading that we do is done within the first half an hour to hour and a half of the equity market open at 6.30. So basically by about 8 o'clock, we're out. Now, the last thing I want to say about this is, uh, and let me just get you oriented time-wise uh, time so where we're at on this chart. Okay, so here's going into Friday morning, midnight Pacific. Most of you know, of course, that the overnight session from the close at 1 o'clock to midnight is called the Asian Trading Session. Big banks in Singapore and Hong Kong trading futures. ES is a heavily traded uh, uh, instrument, million and a half contracts a day. Plus, and then the European session kicks in here. So, for instance, on ES and all the equity markets, overnight, coming into Friday morning, we can see where you were in a very pronounced what? What, were, what kind of, were we in a trend? Here's the end of Friday, uh, no, this is the end of Thursday, and this is the beginning of Friday. So was ES trending? What do you think? Here, from here all the way from late morning, Thursday, and here's Friday, midnight, Friday early trading, 1 o'clock, 2, 3, 4, 5.30, this is the pre-market. Yeah, it was trending up. So um, that's what I was wanting to uh, sort of recover from the... Uh, from the Thursday night part one webinar is that's one of the first things we do obviously is you look at what a market's doing is the market going up down or sideways that's really the first question that you ask yourself aside from what instrument you're going to trade that's the two main things that you start with when you're looking at trading futures right what instrument am I going to trade we mainly focus on there's the small handful that we look at and they're shown right here so we trade crude oil I'll look at that chart later um, ES, the one here, e e mini S&P futures, gold futures, we'll look at that too. Um, some traders trade NASDAQ. We used to have it in the live room. Some of you remember that from years ago. Uh, we started tracking this. Um, there's a fellow named Roy that's a member with us that talked about how the R&B, um, which is gasoline futures, is actually a kind of a leading indicator for moves on crude. Now, I can't speak to that. I just started looking at it on Friday. There appears to be some correlation there with R&B taking the lead slightly, but I need to study that more before I can really, you know, sort of show that to anybody. I need to watch that for maybe like a week and see how tightly they're correlated. On the surface, it looks pretty good. If you put up an R&B chart next to a crude oil, you will notice that it, it just slightly leads it. Kind of like I'm going to show you on YM and ES in a, in a minute here. The Russell futures. Now, a word about the Russell. Some of you still trade to Russell, and you like it. I know you can get some good moves on it, but sometimes it runs counter to the other equities. So that's a challenge with the Russell. Uh, I'm not going to show the Russell today. And, of course, YM, which is the E-mini Dow futures. And all the equities are on the March expiration, contract expiration. Now, in addition to looking at the trend and what instrument you're going to trade, the next step is to determine uh, if the trend is intact when you're looking at it. Now, what I mean by that is that, you can have a condition where you're going up. However, in the short time, you might be going sideways. So what I mean by that is let's look at the pre-market. Here's 625. So 630 Pacific time is when the equity markets open. So we're five minutes right here as of this line from the equity markets open. And one thing we like to do, and Gary does this very well in the room if you've been in there, is put support and resistance lines right on the chart. So, for instance, on ES, we might have a couple of, excuse me, lines that might look something like this. Very clearly, you can see support is down in this area here, 78, 79 area, it bounces. And we can pretty clearly see on the chart, too, that we have some resistance up here around uh, 84 and up here at uh, around 87. Now, that's the third thing. So, the, in order instrument trend up down sideways sideways to up sideways to down right this is all driving what kind of trade decisions we're going to make 
And then we put our support resistance lines. I would strongly urge everybody in here to do this before you go in the live room. But if you go in the live room and you have an instrument like Crude, for instance, and Gary already has lines on there, then go ahead and replicate his lines onto your chart. And you'll start to learn how to do that for yourself. But you really want to learn, you really want to kind of get this down for yourself. Now, there's one other thing I put on here, and this is the last I'll talk about the indicators, is this current day open high low. This is an out-of-the-box Ninja indicator. We didn't develop this. It's just straight out of the box from Ninja. Current day o OHL. And the uh, white line is the low of the day. Black dashed line is the uh, open of the session. And the blue dashed line is the high of the day. Now, you can make those whatever color you want. I just picked white, black, and blue because they show up pretty well on the chart. And I like that because for a couple of reasons. First of all, when a market's making fresh highs, you can, um, uh, you know, clearly see it here. You know, without this indicator, it'd be tough to know that this was, in fact, fresh highs of the day. And this also can set up targets for you. So if you're in a range and you're long, a target would be here and a target would be here. So it's targets, right? If you're short, you can clearly see the low of the day was down here, the range, and there's support here. So if you're short, targets can be here, here, and here. So they, they, they uh, here again, if, if you think of it this way, you need something that gives you form and structure to see where you want to get in and where you want to get out. Any questions? Questions from Louie. Curiosity to use the yellow color support resistance line. I'm asking so it's a colorful color. Um, I use the yellow for the support resistance lines. I, I like it because it stands out on the background colors pretty well. I would like to try to reduce this font. This font's too huge. I haven't figured out really how to do that yet. I'm fighting with that because see how huge it is. Sometimes it's very distracting. I'd like this number to be half that size, but it is what it is for now. And um, yeah, so yellow, pretty much what you see right here is what I trade every morning. When I get up, that's what I look at. And that's what I do. Put the, put the lines on there like that. Okay, good. Now, just a quick word before we look at um, um, uh, trade setups, I want to talk about kind of our style and how we trade, and I want to speak to the two contract uh, uh, issue. So when you're in an uptrend, you have two primary um, uh, types of price action. The first one is what's called the thrust, and the thrust is in the trend direction. In this case, it's up, right? And then you have what's called the retracement or pullback. And that would look like this in an uptrend. So the retracement in an uptrend or pullback is in the opposite direction of the trend. In this case, it is down into support. Now, if you're in a downtrend, the reverse is true, right? Your thrust would be down and your retracement would come back to resistance. And you look for what's called a kiss and roll off of resistance and you take the short. Inverse of the long position. There are several ways to take trades. When you see a clearly defined support area, you can put a limit order to buy there. That's the most simple, simplest way to do it. You can put a limit order above where there's consolidation, getting ready to get long, maybe something like this, or an object trader box. You're filled long on one of these candles that close outside of it. So that's a good example of a long trade. We also have this notion of using a retracement, a retracement line that might look something like this. When you close above it, you get long right here with a market order. There's all kinds of, and you can hit a market order button when the, when the market's sitting right here as well. So we are what you recall retracement traders in a trend. When the market is trending, we take retracement trades. We take the bounces. So this is an example of a long trade. In regards to the two lot, Let's say hypothetically you're filled at the close of one of these bars right here, long. Now, in the case of ES, you're going to want to take a scalp off at around eight ticks. So let's say you put a two lot on here. That's two contracts on your long entry. On the fill here, whether it's a limit order, market order, or an object trader box, by hook or by crook, you're in the market long, right? And then you come, now you can set object trader to automatically do 8 or 10 or 12 ticks on your initial stops. 
which in this case, if you were filled long at, say, let's use around number 82, maybe a little bit under that, but let's just use 82. And eight ticks would be 80, so that would put you right here. That's a little tight, mainly because you're inside of that swing. You probably want to go 10 or 12, and your initial stop would sit just below the mid-band right here. So this establishes your risk. If for some reason this trade doesn't work out and it comes down and hits your stop, that's your full stop out. Okay, that's what that is. We rarely ever let that happen. And why is that? Why is it rare that we hardly ever get a full stop out? That's extremely rare. Any ideas? Let me help you out. What do we do? Let's use an example. This trade worked out, but let's use an example where the trade didn't work out. Let's say that this market did something like this. Let me just lob this out to you to think about it for a second here. What if we get just a little bip up, I don't know, a couple of three, four ticks, and then some, you know, tweet comes in from wherever, what the thing, some blow it up, whatever, and it just, bam, rips it like that. What do you do? What do you do in a case like that? Market comes up, starting the year, and you're in the green, you're making some money. It usually doesn't rip like that, but let's suppose it starts coming against you. Let's suppose it starts coming. Now you're back to zero. Now you're upside down. Now you're upside down. It's dinking around in this box. It's looking pretty weak. It's looking pretty weak. Sell volume's coming in. What do you do? Do you wait till it gets all the way down here to get a full stop out? What do you do when it starts pulling against you like that, going back in a box? You've seen this happen live in the room. If you've been in the room, you've seen us do this, okay? Some, for some reason, a trade doesn't work out, starts pulling against you, pulling against you. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? The wait? Some of you, you know, I've, I've heard of these hope trades, you know, you start moving your stop down. Oh, it's going to bounce. It's going to, next thing you know, you know, you take a $50 loss and it's a $200 loss. All right. More times than not, what happens is, and we teach you this to do this, okay? When it starts pulling against you like this and it isn't working out, you hit the close button. Exit and take a small loss, Sandra. That is correct. Yes. Everybody who answered, Brian, Claude, Ken, Mario, Louis, David, yes. You get out. You just hit the close button. Don't let it turn into a big loss and, and you know, God forbid, don't start dragging the thing down. Don't do that. If you're a hope trader, you got to get away from that. That's going to cost you a lot of money. In the long run, it's not, most times those hope trades never work out. They just turn into huge losses, and you're fighting your way back. So don't do that. Okay, good. So we've talked about how to deal with that. All right. So from the one lot here, we're going to go up eight ticks and put our scalp target, which is going to be located from 82. Let's see, plus two would be 84. Okay, so your scalp target is right at the top where the swing is located. See it? Right here. That's what's called a scalper. Now, on, uh, um, Object Trader can automatically do this for you. It can, If you use the OT tool and you box it in like I have it shown right here, it would automatically put an 8-tick target right there. And when you hit it, it would take one lot off. Now, does everybody know what OCO stands for? What does OCO stand for? Anybody know? OCO in trading. The term OCO means what? OCO. What does that mean? What is OCO? What, do, what, is, what is that? Some acronym for OCO? OCO? Coconut? Coconut cream pie? What are you talking about? One cancels the other. Now, the, the beauty of the OT uh, tool is that once this uh, scalpy comes off at eight ticks right here, then this uh, uh, initial stop of two goes down to one, and you can bring it back to within two or three ticks of your entry like such. So now you have one left for your runner right here. If you've heard me talk about this before, which I've done probably 100 times over the years, now you have a free trade. If this market blows up and comes in your face, it doesn't matter because you're going to net ticks anyway, right? You've made eight on your scalp, you have one lot stop at, at, at uh, uh, two or three ticks. So no matter what happens, you make money. Uh, object Trader can do that, or you can manually do it if you're using market or limit orders. You can move these around yourself. It's absolutely perfectly acceptable, and you can do it. Works out great. 
Now the runner, you can see here, excuse me, on this particular trade, that we put in a fresh high. And let, let me look at another run that had more run to it so I can explain the notion of uh, how we handle our trail stops. Can you see the long that bounced right here uh, in the Asian session when the uh, uh, ES sat on the mid band right here? You can see this was another long trade entry right here off the mid band. It's very similar to this one, only this one didn't quite get the mid band. This one actually sat right on it. We love mid band trades. That's our one of our go to trade setups in trends where you get pushing in, uh, up in the trend direction and pulling back and finding support at or around the mid band. Now, in this case here, can you see this sort of little squiggly green line right here? Looks like a little snake or a worm or something like that. See it kind of following the market up like that? And can you also see that um, uh, line six, the thin green line, when the market moves up, also follows the market up? So trail stops are, um, how would you say, sort of part art, part science. The, we try to give you and use a, a protocol of, and what it comes down to is really whether you make it too tight or too loose. For instance, if you had it too tight, where you're using line six and the stealth line in combination on a trail stop, there are times if it's too tight that you can get bipped out of a trade on a candle and miss the run. Okay. In the case of right here, it would have been close to. And right here, it would have been very close to if you were too tight. So what we recommend is that you try to come outside in the case of the long trail where the market's moving up like this. You want to pull it back a little bit off of line six and a little bit behind the stealth line on your trail. So for instance, in this trade right here, this long trade from down here would have eventually stopped out somewhere right about in here. See that? See how that works? Like that. Right. Now, in the case of this other trade that we took over here with the two lot, remember we were filled long here. We had the initial two stop was down here. Right? Just recapping what happened. We got our eight tick scalp off at 84 right here. OCO, this goes from two to one, comes within two ticks of our entry right here. So now you have one stop here on the initial. And then can you see the little green sneaky snake line and line six snaking up? So your trail would have looked something like this. It would have come up, come up, come up, come up. And then somewhere right about in here, your second contract would have stopped out. Like that. So in essence, if you want to summarize up the two lot approach, that is it right there in a nutshell. Now, of course, if you're trading the short side, it would be the opposite. Everything would be the opposite. You would be filled short, right? You would have a two, uh, two, uh, two contract stop above your entry, right? Your scalp would be eight ticks below, and then your runner would engage, but instead of having a green sneaky snake, you'd have a red one, and it would follow line two on down like that, like this. So it's the opposite. We might have a chance maybe on crude or gold to look at one of those. Any questions on our approach here, what we do? This is the two lot. Now, keep in mind, that's a, that's a trend trade. I want to be clear so we're all on the same page here. When we talk about a two-lot program like that, you're looking for runners. So the market is trending. You know, you have a solid green background. You have a solid red background. You're putting in fresh highs and lows. The mid-band and all the bands are stair-stepping. Now, if we look to the right over here, are we still trending over here? From this point forward, are we still trending? Yes or no? Simple question. Five seconds. Five seconds. Four seconds. Are we trending? Yes or no? Just hit yes. Boop. Why? No. Boop. Three seconds. From here forward, is this market still trending? Yes or no? Two seconds. Enter your, enter your, uh, cast your vote. What's your call? One second. Still trending or not to the right? Time's up. No. Now, you could say, you could say it is sideways to up 
and I would agree with you. So what that means is that we are looking at trading a range. Now when you trade a range, are you looking for runners? When you trade a range like this, are you looking for runners? What do you think? Is this an environment where you're expecting it to go 100 ticks? Probably not. Right. So when you take trades in here, and let's say you're short, and I said this a little bit earlier, you're short from whatever level, you're looking to take profit at support levels. So in this case here, you could do it here, you could do it here, and you could obviously do it down here. So if, if you're getting long, then you can clearly see where the resistance levels are. We have resistance here, and we have resistance up here. So long trade targets would be there. Now occasionally it might break out and run, and if it does, then you can deal with that later and wait for a pullback. Now, the other caveat is that we want to see the range be at least 20 to 25 ticks in, in, uh, in, in overall size. So for here, for instance, we get support around. You don't have to just know a scientific breakout your gonculator and figure it all out. You can just eyeball it. So from 78 to 84 is 6 times 4. That's 24 ticks. This is a tradable range. In fact, from the low here down at 75, 76 to 87 is uh, 10 times 4 is almost 40 ticks. So this is a very tradable range. When we say it's not tradable, if you get these bunched up little things like this, you know, sometimes you'll see a range where it just chops around real tight and it's only like maybe 10 ticks or 12 ticks or something. It's all bunched up and you can't really see the top and bottom. Then you really want to avoid that. John, question here. Does the market open affect your decision on entering trades? Volatility always makes me doubt, but I should enter during to, to 6.30. Um, you know what? I'm going to talk about that because and I'm going to show it. In fact, I'm going to show it right now. That's a good question, John. Let me let me uh, let me let me address that right straight away. One second. Okay, let me address that right now. Here we go. Now, I'm going to show you something, and, and, I, and I want this to help you. But for some people, I think it, 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 they get confused. And I don't want you to get confused by it. So if it doesn't work for you, then don't use it. But what we've started doing over the past maybe six months or, or more is starting to look at market correlations. And the correlations are where markets, some markets, like we talked about uh, gasoline futures, leading crude oil futures, some markets. So, so what, let me back up for a second so, so you just sort of get a perspective on this. Most of you know that fully 75 to 80, pushing maybe almost 85, 90 percent of all of this trading is algorithmic computer trading. You, everybody knows that, right? We as humans are the... The, the, the rare traders, us, that are humans who are trading against the machines are more rare than it used to be. What happens is, is that the big banks have computer developers that work around the world 24-7 developing scripts that not only run on futures but run against Forex, run against options, and, of course, stocks. Now, those algorithms are all coordinated with each other. And what happens is, is that some algorithms – run against some instruments and they take positions ahead of one of other markets so what i'm what, what i'm talking about is this most days and you've been hearing this in the room if you've been coming in the room so you know exactly what i'm talking about is that you have some markets that will be what you call the leaders so their algorithms are tuned to take the lead. So you have a leader or a lead market, and you have a follower. And you'll find out in a minute why I'm doing this. ES is almost always 
there are a few of rare exceptions to this. There, there's been a few, but very, very rare. Where ES will lead the other equity markets. So normally the leaders are as follows. NASDAQ it can be a leader, and it normally is. Russell can be a leader mm, some of the time. YM is very close to NASDAQ. So we don't need to know a lot of detail on why that is. All we need to know is that it exists and we can exploit it and use it to our advantage. You have to realize that when you're fighting machines, you need an advantage, right? You need something that's going to help you. Now, I want to be clear about this. When I show these correlations, there's a couple of different approaches you can take. If you want to trade ES, then what you want to do is look at the other leading markets and see what they're doing. Now, that doesn't say that you should trade it, right? There's a difference between saying, I'm going to trade YM, and I'm, I'm going to trade YM, and I'm going to trade ES, and I'm going to trade NASDAQ, and I'm going to trade, I'll put all these trades on. You don't have to do that. You can simply see what this market is doing ahead of what this market is doing, and then take that to your advantage and take a position on ES, knowing that this has already happened over here. The other option is this. You can put a SIM trade on here or a micro trade. So in that case, you are trading the leader without taking capital risk. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? Okay. So with the concept of correlations where you look at leading markets, what I'm saying explicitly is you don't have to trade them both. If you say, I want to trade ES, but I want to see what the leader is doing, then you can simply observe what it's doing, or hear calls in the room, because I'll be calling that out, or Gary will be calling it out, or you can simply put a SIM trade on here and track it, and then trade this in the same manner. Okay? So let's see what we're talking about here. Now, when we go into this consolidation patch right here, this is right about at the open right here. See it? Let me blow this up so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Can everybody see on the right that the ES chart has a consolidation patch uh, going into the open right here with these yellow bars that looks more or less like this? Can you see it? All right. And that same patch on the left on YM would look like this. Now, when I came into the room Friday morning, and some of you hopefully remember this, I had lines put on my charts, and the lines look like this. I had lines on YM here. I had lines on YM right here. And I had lines on ES here. And I had a line up here. And I said, does anybody remember this? I said, if you break above 84, I'm getting long. If it breaks below support at 81, I'm getting short. Anybody remember those numbers? That's how I got them. If you're wondering how I got those numbers, that's exactly how I got them. At the same time, and right next to it, on the large 32-inch screen, which you are looking at right now, this is exactly what I was looking at on Friday morning, you were looking to short what? In the same condition that ES is in, where would you get short and where would you get long? I'm drawing parallels between, between this uh, patch of consolidation and this patch of consolidation right here. Yeah, you would put a sell order under here, right? And you would put a buy order above here, right? And so, this is, so the correlation is that we would put a sell order over here, right? That's what I, that's what I said when I came in and I had the lines there and you can you can do the same thing on your chart too. Right? You can do exactly what I'm doing on your own chart. You could do exactly the th same thing. Come Monday morning if the markets look like that, you could do exactly the same thing. Right? Now, if ES was to go short, where would the targets be? If ES was to get short and break support, 
where might the targets be located and would you know that ahead of time before you ever took the trade just look at the chart for a minute if you broke here where would it, where might it go to take a minute to think about it so what we're talking about if you're just coming in some of you by the way this is recorded everybody will get a quick copy of the recording if this breaks where is it where could it go and might we know that ahead of time could we trade a two lot here are there two are there two possible targets if it breaks Okay, I see some numbers coming in. Well, let's think about it for a second. Could one of the targets on the short be here? Is, is that a support level? Sure. How about down here? Might it go check the low of the day if we break? What do you think? When, might that be a target too on our break? What do you think? All right, well, that's good. I see the – Jerry, Louie, Claude. Mindy, those Sandra, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see it. Right, seventy-eight ish area, and seventy-five fifty area are your targets. So, in all due respect, wouldn't you know those ahead of time? You do. You know you're in a range. We've done our analysis. We've looked at the pre-market. We've looked at YM. We know what the plan is ahead of time. Yes. We know the plan ahead of time. Now, in the case of the YM, if it broke, which we see that it did, of course, now we see it did, but you could ask the same question to yourself that if you shorted YM, obviously one of your targets would be the low of the day, which it hit right here. Now, I want to look at the time. This is where it gets important, okay? Look at the timing of how this works. YM broke. 22 seconds into the open at 6.30 is when YM broke. 22 seconds into the open. It broke. Yes? All right, let's go over here and look at ES. What's going on with ES? Let's really blow it up so we can get some good granularity around this detail around this right here. 10 seconds into, into the open at 6.30, where is ES? Is ES breaking? Here you're breaking, right here. Here you're breaking, right here. You're breaking it right there. You're at the bottom and breaking it. Where is ES while that's happening? Has it has ES broken yet? Well, no, it's up here. What the heck is it doing up there? Why is it up there? What's it doing up there? Was it waiting on some golden invitation to come down and break? Hmm, let's see. Well, let's, let's play this out a little bit. Here we go. Watch these bars. Watch the bars. There's six, almost 631. Where is YM at 631? Well, YM is already down here. At 631, within one minute into the open, YM is already breaking its low of the day. Where is ES when that happens? right here so what is probably going to happen on ES can you guess what could you take right here with a pretty high degree of confidence that it's going to happen right here 631 right here 631 the bar is sitting right at support and 631 YM is already down here breaking the low of the day. This is what I would call a high degree of confidence. You could leverage the all due respect crap out of it and make a boat pot of money. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Really, I'm serious. I'm not kidding. Watch this. Here's 631. Here's 632 coming up. It's breaking down. At 6.32, where is YM? Fresh lows. Now, at 6.32, is ES even close to the lows of the day? No. It just broke. It just broke. It broke a minute ago. Finally, over here. 
Now, what you see right here, and I'm going to continue the YM chart so you get a really good idea of what's happening. Now you're at 634, 633, 635. YM is continuing to tank. It is putting in fresh lows by almost every tick. When you see this, what is the degree of certainty that you think that you're going to achieve this target? And not only that, but probably get that and maybe break it. When it's 632, 633, you're dinking around here, and this market is ripping down. Would you say that you could have a very high degree of confidence that you are going to hit those targets? By the way, I'm only showing YM because that happens to be the two I have on this huge screen right next to each other, and I trade them for this reason. I'm showing you the reason I trade them just like this. This is why I do it. Now, immediately adjacent to this screen, I have another huge screen, and I have Russell, and I have NASDAQ. In order, it looks like this. To the right hand of the huge screen on the right, I have ES position right here. This is my primary go-to instrument that I trade every morning, and on high likelihood trades like this, I light, load the boat. I'll put eight or ten contracts on here, no problem. To the left, immediately on that screen, I have YM. And position to the left of that on screen number two, is NASDAQ, and to the left of that is the Russell. So those four screens look like this, four uh, charts on two screens. And I'll just show you real quick. So they're all right next to each other. And there's a reason I do this. And I'll explain in a second. Chart number one. Chart number two, and I would strongly urge if you can afford a couple hundred bucks or a hundred bucks, go out and get yourself a couple of big, huge screens. Get yourself a nice graphics card because you are going to make money doing this. Trust me when I tell you that. And so inside of each of these is as follows. On the far right is ES. My primary go-to instrument. Now, your go-to instrument might be YM. I don't know. It might be NASDAQ. It might be Russell. It might be something else. It could be anything. But you want the main thing that you're going to trade right directly in front of you. YM is here. You see it. You're seeing the screen I trade right now, right here. So these two are on one 32-inch flat screen, big honker right in front of me like that, okay? Immediately to the left, on a pole stand to the left, are the other two, like this. And Q is positioned here. I may or may not trade that. I might put a SIM trade on it. I might just simply observe it. And the Russell is sitting over here to the far left. Like that. Like this. So when you're sitting at my trading desk, looking at my screens, the two big ones prominently right in front of me look like this. Just like you see. Imagine taking what you see on here and replicating it to the left with NASDAQ and Russell. Now, why do I position them like that? Any idea on why I position my screens and trade them like that? Why, do I, why, did, I do, why did I set things up like this? After months and months and years and years of, of experimenting with different setups how did i arrive at this combination any ideas why do i have it set up like this every morning i look at the same thing and it looks just like this every morning so there's no question there's no ambiguity when i come in the morning and i look at my charts there's no ambiguity whatsoever i know exactly what i'm going to do right i'm looking for a leader one of these, my primary go-to trading instrument, I told you, is ES. I'm looking to take trades on the leader or the follower. Am I trading the leader or the follower when I trade ES? And you too. When you trade ES, are you trading a leader or a follower? 90, I'd say probably 85, 89, 90% of the time ES is the laggard. I don't know why, it just is. It's the follower. One of these other three will be leading it. And when they start ripping, and they do, 
You can take a high degree confidence trade over here and you can leverage up and make great money. And you don't have to take a lot of trades. You don't have to take a lot of trades. You can take one trade, one good trade like this, and you are done in less than half an hour. That's why I do this. So when you see this happening come Monday morning, and you maybe you want to position your charts like this, maybe they're a different order. You know, you can maybe you go to Instruments YM and you like Nasdaq better, put them on the one screen or whatever. However you want to do it, this is extremely helpful. So in the live room, if I say something like Nasdaq is tanking, it is the leader this morning, and you're looking to short say YM or you're looking to short ES, you can take that with a fairly high degree of confidence. Yes. Likewise, maybe Russell, maybe that one morning, remember that one morning, I think it was like Wednesday or Thursday when all these three were going up, but they weren't going up much. They were sort of dinking their way up a little bit. Remember? I don't want to remember what day that was. I think it was, might have been Wednesday or Thursday. And the Russell was just tanking, fresh lows on every tick, ripping it. And I said, what the heck is the Russell doing over there? What the heck is it doing? Why is it tank? Is that going to be the leader? And sure enough, do you remember what happened? All three of these topped out within like not much, like 5, 10, 15 minutes of the market being open. And they flipped and they ripped and took out their lows. It's amazing to watch. It really is. If you set these four charts up, just as I have described to you, and you watch them right next to each other with the setups that I'm showing you right here, and you develop that, that leader follower understanding, it is money. I'm telling you, it is money. All right, good. Enough about that. Everybody understand the setups? No, I use the same settings, Dave. Can you see the four range settings here on our indicators? The Viper indicators over here, just like this chart. So the only one I've changed to a two range is ES. And I did that because I get much more detail. You don't have to do that. You can put a four. Four is just as good to trade. I like the detail. You get more bars here. See, I get more detail around this entry here. See it? You know, I like that. But, you know, if you like a three or a four, stick with the four. But these other charts over here are, look just like the YM chart, like NASDAQ and Russell. These are four range charts with the Viper indicators. You, uh, Sandra, you change it to a two. Just go uh, right-click on your chart. Go to um, data series. And then in here when you select range, select range. Instead of a four, you just put a two. Now, the other thing is all of the indicators are set for four you might want to change them to two. I just leave them alone myself, but you know, you can do whatever you want. The whole key of having these charts set up like this is that you get comfortable and you see the trades on your screen directly in front of you. Because we have a lot of traders, literally hundreds of traders all over the world that trade different instruments using these setups. You know, currency futures, 6E, 6B, 6A, um, bonds, notes. Yes, John, yes, I take advantage of the volatility by looking for correlations on other markets that could be leading ES up or down and then prepare to take your position on ES based on the leadership of one or more of these other instruments on the setup that you see. Screen one, ES to the right, just like you see here, primary go-to instrument for me, uh, trading. YM to the left, like you see right here, this is screen one for me, engulfed right here like this on this screen. To the immediate left on screen two is the NASDAQ chart with a four range set up just like you see on YM here, and the Russell is to the far left. With this combination, you will be able to clearly see which one of the equity markets is playing the leader for that day. Whatever the leader is, with a high degree of certainty, the others will follow. And ES is normally the last to do it. And that's why I like to trade ES. Because by the time, as you can see here, YM at 630, 633, 634, 635, every tick almost was a fresh low on the day. ES was still sitting way up here. So we had an extremely high degree of certainty that not only would we get achieve target one, but we would probably blow right through that and go and challenge the low of the day and possibly break it right here. Target two. Does everybody see what we're doing there? Now, by the way, I see a ton of people are coming in late. Don't worry about it. We recorded this. 
In fact, what I'll do is I'll email everybody a recording of this, okay? Everybody will get a recording. You don't have to wait for it to get posted on the web. It'll render in a couple hours. I'll shoot by noon or whenever it's rendered. I will get you a copy of this recording so you can watch it again over the weekend. Get ready for Monday morning to start making some money. I see some questions coming in here. Um, David L., Well, I, uh, you might have came in late, David. Yeah, I was showing the details. Uh, you might have missed that, and, and that's okay. So so what we were showing was that this, getting ready to take this short trade on ES on Friday morning, we had made note of the fact that the consolidation pattern here on ES matched the consolidation pattern on YM right here, and that YM was definitely one of the leaders. As I recall, truth be told, and I'll have to check this, I, I think NASDAQ had broken – its support level here, even before the open at 6.30. I think that's what happened. I'll have to, maybe before we wrap, I can quickly, I'm almost out of time, but I can quickly check that. As I recall, it, at like 6.25, NASDAQ was like already down here. It already broken. Yeah. So I, as I recall, NASDAQ was actually the leader. YM followed here right at the open. Within 22 seconds of the open, it broke. And then Mr. Laggard over here at 631 and change finally broke. Yeah, Louis, I'll check that. Before we before we clean this up, let's just finish this trade out, and then I'll pull a NASDAQ chart up and verify that, that, that NASDAQ, uh, in fact, was the leader on the short. Okay? All right, well, let's finish this trade up. We can see here on the left that YM was just absolutely ripping it, tick after tick, fresh low. And um, let's proceed with the ES short uh, here. Okay, here we're at 632, 633, 634. We already know over here, of course, that this was all continuing to be minute by minute fresh lows on YM. Here we go with uh, 634, 635. We achieved target number one on ES right here. Money, ka-ching. We use our, you, if you're using the two lot approach, of course, just to be clear, you would be taking your scalp target right there, right? That would be your scalp target. That's that's uh, let's say you're filled uh, right a tick under here at 83 quarter, uh, 78 and a quarter is actually 12 ticks, or no? Is that right? No, eight ticks, 80 and three quarter, 78 and three quarter, 78 is 10 ticks. Yeah, so 10 ticks on that first scalp. Uh, proceeding on down, uh, here we can see YM continuing to break right here and then we see that 635 we get a little bit of a pullback oscillating around the support level briefly at 636 37 38 39 and here we are at 640 finally es hits the bottom right here target two acquired kaching number two thank you very much isn't that beautiful isn't that a thing of beauty I'm telling you, it's just money. It is just money. Every morning, almost, almost every single morning, this happens. Not always to the downside, not always to the upside. Sometimes it's a range. Sometimes it's a trend and you get a pullback and one bounces and leads the other. <clears throat> yeah, the highs and lows are the same, whether it's a four or a two, David, because the um, size of the bar itself does not affect where the swing level is located. So in this case, for instance, you could have a one range or a six range. It doesn't matter. The high of the day would still be 87. The open of the market would still be at uh, 75.50, and the low of the day would be 75 and a quarter. Yeah. Yeah, now we got some divergence. That's right, David. Uh, and the, the, verge, the divergence happened as such. You now, this happens sometimes, okay? Now, look at what Wyoming does. Wyoming bottoms out here at seven, uh, 639 and change. 640, she starts to take off and starts an ascent with short covering, which eventually turns into some buying. We'll look at that in a second. Here we go with the S. Yes, you get a similar corresponding bounce, but watch what happens. Watch what happens. And this happens a lot. Think of it this way. NASDAQ and YM would be like a, like a how would you say, kind of like a speedboat, like a Donzi on a, on a fast lake or a river, just hauling it on an ocean, right? You know, just hauling it fast, just juicing it, goosing it, and it's speeding, right? And ES is like a tugboat, like a barge. It's moving very slowly. It's like a lumbersome sort of big 
big lumbering bear. You don't move it very fast. Or like a big steam liner that's just kind of chug along. Okay, now here we get a little bounce on ES. We come, we kiss and roll off a of 78. Whatever you didn't take at the bottom for profits, your runner stop, if you believe that there could be a runner on ES, would be placed, as you can see right here, above line two and line uh, stealth. In fact, I believe I recall saying put uh, your run stop, runner stop, if you have any runner stops on, at 78 and a quarter, a tick above line two. Anybody remember that? We kiss, you kiss, kiss and roll. We go back down, 646, 646, 647, and we break the bottom. So can you see the delay? Here at 646, ES is finally breaking the low of the day. And at 646, where is YM? YM's up here. YM's way up here. In fact, I recall saying at the time, put a box on YM and let it go either way. Does anybody remember that in the live room? Put a box on YM and let it go either way. And sure enough, you got a long trade. Right here. So here's 650. So based on what YM is doing at this time, what do we think is going to happen on ES? Think about it for a second, right? Think about it for one second. Take a look at what, what's going on here. What is going on? What is the divergence that is occurring as we speak? What is the divergence that's happening on this chart that is a clue to us on what we might want to do? Look at it. Think about it for a second. What, what have we been talking about? Here's the speedboat. Here's the Donzi. The Donzi has not only bounced and bottomed at 639, but took out the mid-band and these swings. Not only did it come all the way back to 36, all the way by almost to 40, but pull back to a higher low at uh, uh, 910, held the mid band, we boxed it, and we are actually long YM from here. What do we think is going to happen with ES? Because 647 is right here. You are actually breaking the lows at 647 on YM, and at 647, 648, YM is doing this. What's probably going to happen over here? Is it going to go up or down from here? ES. I'll give you five seconds to take a guess. Is ES, on your observation of these charts, is ES going to more likely do that? Or is ES more likely going to do this? Up or down? Four seconds. Put in a U or a D. Cast your vote. In fact, I'll help you out a little bit. Let me give you a little clue. I'm going to show a little bit more YM chart. Okay? All right, there's a little more YM chart. What, what do you think? Up or down from this bottom ES? Cast your vote. Two seconds. Which way is she going to go? Is that a double bottom? Is it going to go up? Or is she going to continue to sell off in the face of YM going up to fresh swings? One second left. Cast your vote. We'll see who's right. One second. What do you think? Show you a little bit more Wyoming chart to help you there. Is that, is that enough to show you? Huh? Here we are at 650, 655. All right, let's show you what happens with we. Almost all of you set up. In fact, I think everybody set up. Good. In fact, how many of you recall that Gary took a long trade when it broke this? You remember that? Gary said, if it breaks 77, 78, are you going to take the long? I said no, right? Because I was still had a runner in. I was just getting stopped on the rest of my four lot. I was just getting out of my short. He was thinking flip. And I was watching this happen over here. I actually called the box and knew this was long already. You, you remember that? All right, watch. Watch what happens. Okay, here we go. Here's 647, 648, 649, 650, 653. 659, what direction was the correct direction? Who was the leader? ES or YM? 
from here, like that. In fact, let's see what 7 o'clock where Wyoming went. She went all the way, 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 all the way back at 7 o'clock to where she broke down for the short. All the way back up. Where's the S going to go? Where's the S going to go? From here to here to where? Any guesses? What do you think? Where could it go next? What do you think? Here we go. Boom. There it is. Yes. Yeah, I put eight lot on in that short. Well, let's do some let's do some quick math and we'll wrap this up. Um so if you short it here, let's just do it quickly in ticks. Okay, so you got ten ticks to here. And 10 tick, and what's this, uh, 75, 50? Let's just do round numbers because we got to wrap up here. 85, 5, 5, 2, two uh, what is that? 5 is 250 plus, let's call that 150 is four bones, four bones on a two lot here. So you took a scalp for 10 ticks. 10 is 100 buck and a quarter. And then this is 5 times 50 is 250, so 375 plus or minus four bones, less commission on the two. So you can do the math if you put eight on there, right? I mean, that could have been one or one or two and done for you right there, right there. Just that short right there. Okay. Forget about the long. The long was beautiful. Long went from, you know, 78 all the way back up to 84. That was your long trade. And you had, your leader was telling you it was going to happen over here. See it? In fact, you could have taken the long here and also made good money on the YM long from here. I know a lot of you did because I called that out and some of you took it right here and we knew the targets the lines are still here i didn't move the lines we knew it was coming to there and we knew that that, uh, that there was a long uh, very powerful likelihood that our friend mr es laggard here was going to go nail that swing right there and sure enough it did let me see if i can get a nasdaq chart up real quick uh you would put the breakdown stop at the uh, uh your initial stop we usually go 10 or 12 ticks in this case here of this break you could have put it like right here at this swing. I wouldn't have gone all the way up to here. I mean, you could have, but you know, you want to keep it pretty tight in the event that's, you know, this was a fake out and comes and just wipes you out. So hold on, let me let me find the Nasdaq chart. Stand by. I'll get back to the to the breaking question of when the time wise, if if um, uh, in fact Nasdaq was the leader down. Stand by one second, please. Okay, here's the chart. Let me go back to the open on. NASDAQ. Like I said, as I recall, I think that she had actually broken in the pre-market. Uh, yeah. Okay. So here you go. Uh, let me show it this way. I got it kind of right in the middle. Stand by. So everybody remembers those times, right? Everybody remembers the time. Six, six, uh, uh, 630, 631, 632, 633 was the fresh lows on Wyoming. And then the laggard ES, right? You remember that? Okay, so so we're going to look at times on uh, on uh, NASDAQ uh, right here. So, you know, you can make the case that uh, on NASDAQ, the swing was located right here. And sure enough, just before the market opened at 6.29 and change, you challenged it right here. And then at 6.30, you bip up here for three seconds. And then at 6.30.07, 15 seconds before uh, YM breaks, uh, NASDAQ broke right here. So I was wrong. It wasn't the pre-market. It was literally three seconds into the open of the equity market, 6.30, six seconds right here. Let's see, at 6.31, NASDAQ was down here at the same time correlating with the uh, break of the bottom on, um, on YM. So in this case, you had two leaders. You had NASDAQ leading YM by a few seconds in terms of the short break. And then um, I'm not sure where the Russell came into play. I know it was right in there. And then, of course, you saw the ES short and how that played out. And then, you know, of course, by 634, 635, you know, YM is getting to, it's still continuing to break the bottoms. 
this in this case here, as I recall, now this this is this makes sense, is that we were not breaking the lows on this. In fact, the low of the day on NASDAQ was way, 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 way down there. So it wasn't breaking the lows. But as you can see, it was selling off very precipitously from here to here. And then you got a deep pro bounce, which NASDAQ does. You'll get these deep coverings. And then NASDAQ just rolls and falls right off the map right again right there. And then interestingly enough, what did NASDAQ start doing when YM did it? Where was the bottom? Well, it was right here at 639. See it? See it right there? That was the bottom on NASDAQ too. And she started to do what? What did old Spazaru start to do? Head up a little bit. Uh, Dave, I use I use NT7 pretty much exclusively right now. Um, I've worked with eight. Our indicators work on eight. Um, and we're still trying to port the object trader tool over to eight. But your indicators, if you want to trade eight, are set up just like this. Your chart will look exactly like this on NT8. So, you know, it's a personal preference. I've just been using seven for so long. And when I went to Denver, they told corporate management told me and everybody else that, you know, they're going to keep supporting seven pretty much forever. I don't think it's going to be like a Microsoft where they ditch seven at some point. You know, Microsoft's going to stop supporting Windows seven. I think Does anybody know when that is. I think it's next month, isn't it? I love Windows seven. A couple of my machines have 10. I mean, I work with 10. I'm getting used to 10. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like ES. I'm a slow, slow moving steamship. <laughs> I don't, I don't change things too quickly when I'm happy with them. Is it the 14th? Yeah, I knew it was coming up. So. All right. Well, I hope this helped. Um, everybody saw how we use these correlations to, uh, we use, take advantage of uh, uh, leadership up or down in the equities to establish uh, positions in other markets. Like I said, you don't have to trade NASDAQ. You can simply put a SIM trade on here or simply observe it on another screen, as I have shown you here, and how I've positioned these charts all in like, I mean, it's almost like the second screen is an extension of the first screen because I have two big, huge pole stands. So back here, I have poles supporting both of them. So literally, they are right next to each other, these screens like this. There's a big stanchion pole that holds both of them up right next to each other, like, like this. So there's a big pole behind this one. And there's a huge pole behind this one holding it up. And they sit on, I have a, a huge table next to me, next to my desk. And then there's a, they sit on these stanchion pole supports like this. So they're sitting literally right next to each other. So one, one screen is almost like an extension of the other screen. Yeah, it looks like that, just like that. It's great. Since I got that 32-incher, man, I'm telling you, it's like it's like the world has opened up. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not kidding. It makes a huge difference, those big screens. Spend some money and get yourself a couple of big screens. It's worth every penny. Okay, Louie, thanks for sticking around. Everybody, uh, you can go 27-inch too, Rand. You don't have to spend the money on a 32. 27 is a very nice size screen. I'm probably going to switch all mine out to 32s, but, I mean, 27 is good. Even 24 is good, too. But, um, you know, no matter what size you have a screen, I'm just talking mainly about sort of how it's positioned uh, to trade like this. So you can clearly, quickly, very quickly see which market is doing the leading and which market is following. And normally it's going to be ES. When you can take these, you can leverage these trades with some confidence, knowing that the little follower is going to follow. Uh, you can use a TV, too, if it's got the proper inputs, John. Uh, a 32-inch Vizio will work, sure. Oil and gold are on two separate screens. Um, uh, uh, who was asking that? Matt. Okay, so let me see how I can explain this. Uh, so here, I can do it like this. Let me do it like this. All right, so I have two other big 27-inch screens sitting up here on the same pole that look like this. Uh, and the pole, the pole holds both screens. 
and you can get these poles you know you can just find them on the web they're not that expensive so the setup looks like this and then over here to the right is gold so I have the gold chart here and I like that because I can see gold here, here's how I look at it I look at ES and YM and I look at what gold's doing golds are right up here golds right above it so I glance up quickly and I can see what gold's doing right here on this chart right directly above it like that see it okay and then so that's up there and then crude is to the left crude is over here and I, both, I give crude and gold full screens like that. They have their own screens positioned above these two screens, which hold the four equities in the sequence I have shown you here. Yeah, if you trade crude oil as your primary go-to instrument, then go ahead and put, see, in this case, you'd have a crude uh, screen, and you put it right in front of you like that. And then your secondary trade, whatever that is, put that over here. And then, you know, if you have four, you pick what the, uh, I can't, Stephen, I'm out of time. I'm going to, my apologies. Let's, let's do that next week. Hold on. I'm going to hit stop the recorder. Stand by. I got it. I got to get going. I have some commitments. My apologies, everybody. Um, let me stop the recorder.